Hello folks, today we're going to be talking about instruction set architectures or ISAs in other words. This is sort of the first video on the subject and, and on another video we will be continuing discussing this topic. If you remember from our previous classes, complex systems consist of various layers and computer in particular has many design steps which are built by putting together many abstract layers. Two of these layers are the microarchitecture and the instruction set architecture. Before we start talking about ISAs, let us remember the basic computer operation, which was about three basic steps, fetch, decode, and execute cycles. Uh, in addition to these three, uh, there were also locating operands, loading, storing data, which were essentially, um, you know, the fundamentals uh, for the von Neumann model. The unavoidable element of one human model was was called program counter and it was pointed to the next instruction after executing the current one so what is instruction set architecture it's it's a very well defined interface uh, or in other words contract between the software and hardware I say is defined the functionalities of operations modes uh, storage locations supported by the hardware and, um, and ISA is also defined precisely how to invoke and access microarchitecture resources. However, ISAs, for example, do not guarantee or say anything relevant uh, with regard to the way, uh, way, the way operations are performed or handled. They do not tell about operations you know, being fast, slow, prioritized, or power hungry. What makes an ISA good um, is also, a ther in a, I think, another question. Uh, probably you wouldn't want to write uh, very long lines of code to perform a simple mathematic operation, right? So one of the criteria might be the programmability. Um, the other one could be the implementability. In other words, an ISA set that can lead to simple hardware but yet enables writing high-performance programs um, or low-power programs or reduced-cost programs or more, more importantly, highly reliable programs like that that doesn't break. Finally, a good ISA must maintain, maintain programmability to different versions. This is either called backward or forward compatibility. As an example, in a good ISA, new processors, for example, must support all programs, and similarly, old processors must support new programs. This is called, again, uh, the backward or forward program, um, uh, backward or forward compatibility. One of the well-known and maybe the most popular, most implemented architectural model of our generation is known as von Neumann model. And as the name implies, introduced by John von Neumann in 1945 in an army-supported project. It's a stored program computer, in other words, instructions are stored in memory. Uh, I think you are already familiar with this, with this model, but we're going to be now touching upon the details. The program counter is the in inevitable part of this model and it points to the right set of instructions to be fetched and executed. The same linear memory is used to store both instructions and data. If they were separate, that was called hardware architecture, if you remember. Control signals, on the other hand, are used to determine which is which. In this model, instructions are fetched and executed in sequential order and unless, unless otherwise told, one instruction is processed at a time. This sequential order is maintained unless the instruction says otherwise. For example, a branch or a jump instruction. Uh, they can alter the program counter value. So here is the block diagram of the von Neumann model. As you can see, processing unit is in direct communication with memory, which holds both instructions and data. The control unit has an instruction register to fetch instructions, and the program counter or instruction uh, pointer shows the next instruction to be executed. Control unit manages the processing unit, memory, input, and output devices by sending appropriate control signals. As clear from this simple illustration, the instructions are fetched and ex executed in the control flow order, which is determined by the program counter. So, are there any other alternative models? Yes, there are. One of, the, one of them, for example, is known as the data flow model. In that model, an instruction is fetched and executed in the data flow order. This happens as soon as the operands are ready. In that case, the execution order is determined by the data being ready or not. And hence, there is no need for program counter. As you can see, the example right top of this slide, there are five operations that can be fetched and executed by the von Neumann model. Yet in the data flow model, which is shown using bubbles to the right of the sequential model, A plus B and 2 multiplied by B can be done simultaneously. And likewise, 
uh, v minus w and v plus w can be done simultaneously again. Therefore, uh, we can execute instructions in parallel, and this makes data flow model inherently faster. However, the state of the data flow model must be kept somewhere, um, you know, otherwise uh, we will have no idea where the program is uh, while executing the set of instructions. So, but this also makes the debugging more challenging, and, and, and this, this also leads to more complex hardware as well. Uh, so the question is, which one is simpler for you? And most of the people, uh, most of the students uh, argue that, you know, sequential model is more logical and, 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 and simpler. So we face one of the many uh, ISA trade-offs, uh, ISA level trade-offs that we will learn in this video, uh, namely the data flow or control flow uh, question. Deciding on one of these architectures uh, usually does not, on, does, on, does not only involve making decisions on the parallelism, but also on the complexity and latency issues. Due to the complex nature of data flow implementations relative to one Newman model, data flow architecture hasn't reached a commercial success of its time. Going, going back to ISA discussions, these architectural models determine how the programmer sees the execution order. As in today's microprocessor technology, microarchitectures, even though they use one Newman model, but they, they can execute instructions in any order, and the programmer does not know the order at all. Um, however, they have to obey the microarchitecture designers, they have to obey the semantics specified by the ISA when making the instruction, um, you know, results visible to the software. So these are, these are important uh, topics to discuss. As we mentioned, most of the commercial ISAs in the market use one Newman model. Microarchitecture, which is beneath the ISA level, can, can use advanced implementation techniques serve the, to serve the programmer better in terms of performance, cost, latency. These ISAs can be, for example, x86, ARM, MIPS, etc. Anything that's not consistent with the model is not exposed to the software. ISA is a contract, as I said, between, between the software and hardware, um, and, uh, and the microarchitecture is a specific implementation of the ISA. So think about the question, which one is easier to change? ISA or microarchitecture, which one? Remember that ISAs are like standards. Once you set, you have to be backward or forward compatible. And all the software you write must obey the semantics implied by the ISA. Whereas the microarchitecture designer can do anything he wants, as long as he's compatible with what ISA definition. So keeping these mind, in mind, uh, try to answer that question, which one is easier to change? So the ISA architect can expose a set of resources for the programmer to use and control the hardware. Here the, here the programmer is not just simple uh, you know, C or Java uh, programmer, uh, but here I mean it's compiler or assembler writer you know, who, who knows how to deal with the available hardware resources. What you see in this slide is what is expect, exposed in general to the software programmer. You know, it includes opcodes, addressing modes, address space, virtual memory management, call interrupt uh, handling, you know, access control, priority, privilege, um, you know, I.O., task threat management, in more advanced, uh, uh, you know, in more advanced processors like power, thermal management, multi-threading support, and multi-processor support. Yet simple and more religious ISAs may not expose all of these to the programmer. It's just a design option. And x86 exposes all of them to the software level, by the way. So we design ISA microarchitectures based on the based on set of some set of considerations, like cost, performance, power consumption, and durability. Uh, there are also two other availability and time to market, you know, because we already covered cost, performance, power, and durability and reliability. Um, but like power and cost uh, availability and time to market are also as important as the rest of the other criteria. There have been various two different ISAs over the past 40 50 years. They differ in terms of complexity, ISA code size, specifications, power consumption, and reliability. For example, x86 and VAX are examples for Cisco architectures. They're also single instruction, multiple data uh, processed ISAs, such as Cray 1 and VLIW ISAs. Uh, on the other hand, RISC ISAs are relatively simpler and have less number of instructions compared to more complex instruction architectures. Opcodes uh, address the job, in, uh, the job instruction is supposed to do. There are also operand fields, which indicates the values the instructions would be operating on. We will touch base on more details about the instruction ingredient, ingredients, uh, ingredients in the next lecture. 
Here are some example RISC ISAs, 32 bit long uh, alpha, for example, and 60 bit long LC3B. As you can see from these examples, of course, under the beginning in the ISA specification, it is a nice characteristic of RISC approach as the locations of these fields known to microarchitecture will make the control logic simpler. On the other hand, x86 may have opcodes all over the place depending on the prefix. The control logic needs to figure where the opcode is located. This is more work than simply decoding the instruction. LC3B uh, uses 4 bits for the opcode, which enables 16 different operations to be performed. However, this ISA has a steering bit for some of the instructions, which ultimately means 32 operations that can be supported in total. You can have more information about these ISAs in the references provided, and reading these documents will help you learn a lot. Another risk ISA is the 32-bit long MIPS uh, architecture. This resembles to the previous ISAs we have covered. It has three simple formats with an opcode of size 6 bits. You can imagine how many instructions can be encoded with this ISA yourself. Uh, as you can see, there are three formats, register, immediate, and jump. The SH field specifies the number of uh, positions for the shift operation. Immediate field can be used with branching operations and target field can be used, for example, to update the program counter value to jump to another location in the program. The design of the ISA depends heavily on the operand model um, and keep that in mind because uh, we will cover that in the next lecture. In this class, we've introduced instruction set architectures when Newman and data flow models talked about some of the trade-offs associated with architecting a computing machine. We have given examples of some of the popular ISAs and analyzed different fields of operation. In the next lecture, we will explore more details of ISAs and trade-offs associated with operand models, addressing modes, and we'll also talk about instruction types and interrupts. Thanks for your attention, and please email me with your any questions you have regarding today's class, and see you soon.